Hello and welcome to the 13th episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series chronicling Uganda's political and economic history, Ambat Kakoza. In the previous episode, we looked at Amin's increased brutality, including the murder of Archbishop Janan Luumu. In this episode, we focus on Amin's invasion of Tanzania and the retaliation by Tanzania together with Ugandan exiles. We also look at the Moshi Conference and the subsequent fall of Amin's regime. Thanks for joining us. The murder of Archbishop Janan Luum was the latest in a long line of atrocities that was greeted with international condemnation. This criminality, this brutality, tyranny, murder of Ugandans, helped expose it, I mean, to the to Ugandans in particular and eventually to the rest of the world. Uh, we were very quiet because the people have told us that he was, if you talked, he would kill your relatives. And of course, most of our relatives were in Uganda. Uh, many of us had decided not to come back. Some had jobs. I was very lucky. I got a, a lectureship at the university. And indeed, throughout my exile in the UK, I was teaching at the universities. Then we realized that really it didn't matter. Whether you spoke or not, he would kill you anyway. So we decided to come up in the open and oppose him. We founded the Uganda Group for Human Rights. I was their chairperson. They elected me chairman. Then we became very, very popular because most people didn't like what Amin was doing here. So they welcomed us. They gave us support. They financed us. They gave us logistics. And so we became the spokespersons in, U in, in Europe of the opposition against Idi Amin. By August 1978, Amin's sack of close associates had shrunk significantly. It was increasingly risky to be too close to Amin, as his vice president and formerly trusted associate, General Mustafa Driss, discovered. When Driss was injured in a suspicious auto accident, troops loyal to him became restless. The once reliable Marilla mechanized regiment mutinied, as did other units. In October 1978, Amin sent troops still loyal to him against the mutineers, some of whom fled across the Tanzania border. Amin then claimed that Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere, his perennial enemy, had been at the root of his troubles. In a provocative move, the six-foot, four-inches ex-boxer challenged the diminutive Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere to a boxing contest. Amin offered to enter the ring with one of his arms tied behind him. When Nyerere ignored him, he remarked that if Nyerere had been a woman, he would marry him as he was very beautiful. He deployed troops at the border with Tanzania, initially purposely to deter the rebel soldiers who had taken refuge into Tanzania from making incursions into Uganda. Kastiria Gwanga was then a junior officer in the defunct Uganda army. They crossed over into Tanzania to drink. As you know, soldiers, they go drinking. They used to cross border and go in Tanzania. Now when they went, they had a fight with Tanzanian soldiers. There was a squad of soldiers, Tanzanian. Across the border? Across. Now Ugandan soldiers were beaten badly. So they rushed back to the barracks, jumped into APCs and went back. When those people, the Tanzanian soldiers, saw these guys coming back in armored vehicles, they took off. As if they have fought a war, they have defeated this one. They went into a town called Chaka. So they looted, looting in shops. Without any, we, we don't even, even know anything. Hoping to divert attention from his internal troubles and rally Uganda against the foreign adversary, he invaded the Kajera salient in northwestern Tanzania, on November the 1st, 1978, with great destruction of lives and property. 
This was Amin's major error, for which he was later to pay a grievous price. So when those soldiers, the Tanzanian soldiers, ran back, they contacted headquarters in Mwanza, and they sent a company, just a company. But you know what that company used? They used 81 millimeter mortars. Yes. I mean, he knew he had a big army, tanks and air force. So he, he said he, he, there is the, planes. Yeah, planes to go and bomb the what? The bridge, which they failed to do. To, and they had to get guys from Chembe Mine. Cool. Yeah, they, they put dynamite. That's how, that, how they blew up that, that bridge. You know, when they crossed Mutukura and <coughs> went into Tanzania, they were cutting off women's breasts. They burnt down the sugar factory. <clears throat> and they committed all kinds of atrocities. That's when Tanzania resolved that this man has got to be pushed back. But tactfully, initially, it was a question of pushing Amin's soldiers back to Uganda and stop there. But then when they got to the border, they said, this man, Amin started using Air Force. He had MiG-19s, MiG-21s. He started bomb- bombarding them. Now, Amin's excesses had galvanized the opposition, especially the external forces, living as exiles in various countries. For Tanzania, this was the last straw. For all Amin's enemies, who till now had failed to dislodge him from power, it was the chance for which they had prayed and waited for so long. The, the, the first international meeting we had was in 1978. Uh, you were Kaguta Museveni, now president of the, our, our country. Elia Kategaya, the late Johnny Barije, uh, various other people, Martin Alike and others, we met in Lusaka to organize an international Uganda group and determine how we fight Idi Amin. We founded the Uganda Liberation uh, committee, uh, I, I don't think that was the exact name, but it was intended for that. Many people who attended also belonged to the UPC. So when they realized that we are not necessarily for Poro or Bote, they leaked the information. So suddenly we are in the East African and the other media that Ugandans have met in Rusaka and that they want to overthrow. I mean, so we are undermined. Uh, our leadership was not very strong, so we fizzled out. But from that meeting emerged a very, very strong spirit to really form a national front, insisting not just a few people in East Africa, but worldwide. And I contacted the late Kaira, uh, Andrew Kaira. Uh, other people contacted people like uh, uh, the late Omonyo Jok, uh, Professor Tandon, Professor Rugumayo, who were in exile elsewhere. And the first meeting uh, was in Nairobi, the eve of December, 78. So we met and we decided that we should form a consultative committee to invite everybody to attend a national convention preferably in a friendly country like Tanzania, and then form a national front to fight Idi Amin. Uh, in Nairobi, because he was host, uh, Tassis Kabwejiri became our chairman. We called ourselves the discussion group, Nairobi discussion group. We would go and meet in each home and discuss, assign people the topic, the economy, the politics, uh, the social, how do we recover from Amin and so on. And this had become <clears throat> a, a routine activity. The last meeting that decided on gathering Ugandans in, in diaspora was held in my house. So I became the chairman. Nyerere mobilized his citizen army reserves and counterattacked. He was joined by Ugandan exiles. So Tanzania now allows Ugandans also yeah, to take advantage, <laughs> yes, to take, to take advantage 
uh, and 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 they allow organization organizing both militarily and politically. They they did put together a force within within about two months, and 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 uh, the force mainly of, of not of the regular UPDF but of the of the uh, uh, Gambo. So the war started. Then, as usual, Ugandans had our own problems. Those who had gone to Tanzania in exile with Obote were on one side. Those who went afterwards, like us, were on another side. Because those were saying, if we go to fight, we go to fight for Obote to go back. We used to say, no, we want to go back with or without Obote. <laughs> so we had that problem right from the beginning. So you didn't belong to any fighting group at that time? No, I did. I, I was with the Save Uganda Movement. Oh, Save Uganda Movement. Mm. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, but Tanzania organized us into groups and sent us where we are supposed to go. With due respect to the people who sacrificed their lives and time and property, of the Ugandans, really were just there as a front, but the really fighting was by TPDF, the Tanzanian People's Defense Force. They had the guns, they had the morale, they were well facilitated, but for diplomatic purposes, we really looked like we were the ones fighting. They, they needed us to help them find their way around. But, but for anything else, they were in charge. They were financing the war, they were commanding the war, they were, what else? They had the, the money to do anything. So what, what could we do ourselves? UN Rumu 7 is for NASA, which also had a substantial number of armed fighters concentrated in the Western Axis. We played our part uh, in the sense that our organization really was in the West, but outside the country really nobody knew about us. At first, both Tanzanian forces and the Ugandan groups were convinced that the war to dislodge Amin was not going to be easy. They knew he had a big army and relatively equipped air force. But Tanzania's long-range artillery that came to be referred to as Saba Saba played the trick. Its thunder-like deafening sound sent Amin soldiers in disarray. The BM they were using, we didn't have it. We were using 120 millimeter. 160 millimeter motors, motors mostly yeah. this 76 yes. millimeter those were guns of second world war yes. but these guys because they had chinese links they had already the tanzania army had already acquired this bm yes. Yes. so they could just come woo, 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 and we have never seen that something like that that's when people panicked it had not been foreseen that he would collapse so quickly no and in fact, at least on our side, it had been assumed that now the struggle would start and continue for a long time. Apart from Obote, who looked at himself as the president in waiting, a position that was not acceptable to the rest of the fighting groups, there was an obvious leadership problem that urgently needed to be addressed. President Yerere talked to Obote, said, man, you are the former president. Try and bring your a team of Ugandans together. So they don't appear to be an invader, an imperialist trying to, to impose Tanzania on Uganda. Mm. But he tried, he couldn't. We convinced Tanzania last time that Obote would be a disaster if he came the first time. We told him the, the, the support for the, for, for the removal of men would be a very, very different thing. You know? And... Uh, if you remember, Kosar Marumu had, their route was Mutukula, Masaka, this way. And they never recruited any, very few people to join them. 
unlike our end, where we recruited these young fellows who have turned out, who turned out to, to help us later on in the West. This is Moshi, a town in northeastern Tanzania's Kilimanjaro province. It is a significant factor in Uganda's fight against Amin, in that it is here that from the 24th to 26th March 1978, representatives of the 32 groups of Ugandan exiles met in what was named the Moshi Conference that brought together all the anti-Amin groups to form one united front known as the UNLF. The Moshi, uh, uh, in a place outside the Dar es Salaam, uh, wa, 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 was much better uh, for the neutralization of the influence of Obote. Yeah. Obote was in, in, in uh, Dar es Salaam with lots of people who were there and uh, there is no way he could not have been a participant, a direct one. So when he goes, when the, the conference is organized in Moshi, and he's physically not allowed to travel there. So his influence becomes a remote control one. Why was he restricted from traveling to that? Uh, it was, no, it, not just traveling to Moshi, but becoming a crucial factor in the post amin arrangements. It was, of course, clear uh, that the struggle against Amin was mainly in Uganda and the West at the beginning until Kampala was captured. And with Obote at the head, it would have been very difficult for cooperation, to, for getting cooperation of the Baganda. And, and so his visibility had to be minimized. UPC's strategy was to sabotage the meeting so it never takes place. Their main view was that we should the fighting groups should recognize Obote as president in exile, and he should come back as a, as a, a president. Our aim was no. Nobody was going to come into Uganda as president except he passes through the, 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 the Moshi meeting. There was a group of committee of unity among, among Ugandans, led by Nabudere, Omonyo Jok, and um, Yashtanba. Now this went to Yerere and asked him, can he support them? So if he could, they could link up with another group called is it Nairobi discussion group, I can't remember the title, led by Professor Kawijek. It was agreed that this committee of unit among Ugandans should organize this meeting of Ugandans. You know, there were 32 groups. Obote, with his team of military guys led by Oito Jok, had co brought together a, t a team of fighters. Museveni had also a group of Fronasa, which were remnants of the 1971 yeah, invasion. They also were there. Then uh, uh, Pajok, Akena Pajok, had a group called SUM, Save Uganda Movement. That's another fighting group. Uh, Obote's group was called Kikosi, Kikosi Malum. Um, what else? There were two other groups. So about five fighting groups. But the rest were just political groupings. Yes, political. Ranging from monarchists, Marxists. A whole spectrum of, uh, of political ideologies. I came as part of a delegation of a group called UFU. Uganda Freedom Union, which was based in the U.S. Uh, I was the secretary general of the group. Uh, the late Andrew Kayera was our chairman, and we had two delegates to that conference, uh, Bishop Festo Kivenjere and myself. So when we went to Moshi, uh, I was one of those uh, members, Kayera, Tandon, Omonyo Jok, on what was the credentials committee to identify the delegates of these groups who had sent them and allow them in the hall. Yeah. And there was a very, very interesting incident. When we got there, uh, the UPC came in a mass because there were so many there, they were in Zambia. They said, for us, every Ugandan should be admitted 
because every Ugandan has a right to determine their own destiny. So they came in their thousands to be admitted. We said, no, we are not going to admit you. UPC must be represented by two people, DP two people, any other group two people. That is the concept we have. But uh, we wouldn't have managed it except Tanzania was with us. Yeah. So when they realized that uh, UPC was trying to disturb us, they called Oboti and his colleagues and said, please, we, we accept the principle of what these young men and the politicians have done. If you don't want to cooperate with, with them, leave Tanzania. And we are proceeding with those people who want unity. So they succumbed. Within 24 hours, UPC had divided itself into about 14 groups. Uh, there was the Morongosh Club, uh, the uh, Veterans Wing of UPC, there was the Women's League, uh, but we didn't m mind because we all the same outnumbered them. So we accepted them. We proceeded with the meeting, and uh, when uh, the debate st became sterile because the UPC were really sabotaging it, some of us see what was happening. Uh, Professor Kabugajere, brilliant as he was, he had no experience of dealing with the politics of this kind. Uh, so unknown to him, <coughs> we went behind his, his, while they were debating. Ugumayo, myself, Tandon, uh, and other people we met. Semei Nyanzi was with us there. So we said, this man is not getting us anywhere. Let us replace him with Semei Nyanzi. So we came back, sat down. And as we sat down, Rugumayo put up his hand. Uh, Kabugajen must have thought that he wanted to contribute to the debate. He said, Mr. Chairman, I propose that uh, we elect Semei Nyanzi as the chairman of the conference. And everybody said, yeah, yeah. they all agreed. Kabugajen is as if he had been hit by lightning. <laughs> so uh, when he realized there was a consensus for him to be removed, he peacefully moved out of the chair and the Nyanzi now became the chairman. We, I, I drafted the constitution with the late Steve Aliko, uh, the late Magezi, um, and others. We presented it at the next plenary session. It was adopted. Now, in that constitution, we had said there would be chairman of the National Front, deputy, no, not a deputy, vice, uh, vice chairman, and then commissions, military commission, political commission, and so forth. Now, when we created the military commission, unknown to us, and we were all very naive, and we didn't know the, the, the military importance of it, UPC zeroed on the military commission, although it was one of the small uh, commissions. For them, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. So when we came to elect, everybody knew that there was a consensus for Yusuf Rule to become the chairman and eventually the president when we defeat Amin of Uganda. Tanzania wished that. International community who had contacted us say that was a good choice. President Rule was an invitee of the president in Mwari Munyerere. They had been together in Makerere. You needed to have somebody who could be acceptable leading a new government in, 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 in Uganda, replacing Amin, but with a stature that even the British, who seemed to have supported Amin, would still would recognize him. So when they, we formed the organs of the, of the UNLF and we were now saying who should lead, the name of Rude came up. And sure enough, you know, you had Martin Alika standing, you had Mwanga standing. And we had to jiggle around to see how we could get Mwanga out. Then he was representing UPC and representing Obote. So finally we had to, uh, to persuade uh, him and, uh, and uh, Martin Alika to step down for Rule. So Rule came in because of the following. First, a Muganda. Second, a well-known person uh, who would capture the diplomatic uh, support. Three, he was uh, an old man. 
uh, but purportedly. he was not a politician but yeah but that's what the whole point was that you didn't want to have one who had a record either hated or lived by the way there we formed a coalition of uganda fighters and formed the unla uganda national liberation army to which all the five fighting groups from nasa Kosmalu, save uganda movement uh, uganda freedom movement all those who had their they came now under Uganda National Front, under the command of Tito Kelo and the chief of staff, Awito Jok. And then for the formation of NCC, uh, each group was given, giving one person. Yeah. And we ended up with the group of, of 30, which formed that important political organ. Now, the UNLF was governed by 11 member executive council that was chaired by Yusuf Lure. This was accompanied by the National Consultative Council, NCC, which became Uganda's interim parliament, with one member for each of the 28 groups represented at the Moshi Conference. Meanwhile, the Tanzanian forces, together with the National Liberation Army, UNLA, had captured most of the southwestern parts as well as Masaka area and were steadily advancing towards Kampala. For me, I was a call from the United States to come and work as uh, somebody to talk to areas uh, which would have been captured and then talk to the public, tell them that they are not after the Ugandan but the army people. And I was assigned to take over Masaka Axis and Rangaranga to um, Barara Axis. I came with Francis Kizito. We are two political commissars to Masaka Axis. The Rangaranga went alone and he met others uh, in Barara, on Barara Axis. Muhammad Gaddafi sent 3,000 troops to aid Amin. But the Libyans arrived too late to salvage the situation. Amin's army was already in Saray, running away from the Tanzanian intense bombardment. People had left the front line. They said, one big gun, can imagine? With you no know, big guns, we are, not, we are not fighting. That's when Gaddafi said in the Libyans, my, my battle was attached to, a, a one, to these whole wizards, 155 millimeter. But they were so heavy. And being a rain, it was a rain season by that time. They could bog down, so we had to leave them alone. We said we had to help the Libyans. And they were left just completely helpless. They didn't know the place, the terrain and everything. And most of those young boys died. Because whenever they used to ask the direction to Kampala, they could tell them, show, showing them where they're coming, where they know the Tanzanians are coming from. They said, that is Kampala. On April the 11th, 1979, the anti amin forces entered Kampala to a great rousing welcome. They announced the capture of Kampala and the end of the regime of Idi Amin. The war that had cost Tanzania an estimated one million US dollars per day was over. Now, Amin fled to Jinja, then to Libya and later to permanent exile at Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. In the next episode, we feature Lure's 68 days presidency, the Benaisa's umbrella, and the military commission takeover. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>